You used to be able to have it in any color as long as it was tan and brown. And now finally, black. It's not every day the world gets a new Chromax refresh from Noctua. In fact, it feels like it is a monumental event every time a classic colored Noctua fan or heatsink gets updated. The U9S isn't a new cooler from Noctua, but oh man, this thing feels really good to be back in black. Hey there, and welcome to Machines and More. I just took a stab at making my own semi Chromax U12A cooler, and today we're taking a look at a bona fide refreshed 92 millimeter fan tower cooler from Noctua. Noctua sent by the refreshed version of the U9S, so a big thanks to them for making this review possible. So while it's pretty unreasonable to ask this little cooler to compete with 120 millimeter fan coolers and even a 240 millimeter AIO, that's precisely what we're going to do today because in a case like the Encase M1 right here, it is the best tower cooler option. My primary objective is to review it in the Encase M1, but since we've also had a few questions regarding this cooler from our viewers, I'll also be taking a quick look at it in the Cooler Master NR200. But first, let's take a look at a few key specs of this cooler as well as what it comes with. Now the U9S is a single tower cooler that comes in at 125 millimeters of height, which makes it ideal for SFF cases like the NK M1, which has a height limit of 130 millimeters. I weighed this heatsink in at 530 grams or so, and that makes it on par with the ID Cooling SE 224XT, which is a larger 120 millimeter fan, uh, tower cooler. Uh, it's heavier than three of the 120 millimeter heat sinks that we recently tested uh, for the channel in the 5 for Ryzen 5 roundup. It's quite square and chunky in shape and included with it is a single 92 millimeter NFA9 uh, by 25 millimeter fan. It features five high quality dual loop heat pipes running through a very shiny uh, mirror like base. You can see how shiny that is. Uh, this is a nickel plated copper base. The machining is absolutely spectacular on this base plate. Now with the Chromax update, the heatsink has this luxurious satin like feel to it. Certainly Chromax is all about the looks, but the color scheme also opens it up to discerning enthusiasts, which may have passed on the original version because of what it looked like. The cooler comes with standard mounting hardware for AM3 and AM4 from their Secure Firm 2. Uh, mounting solution, Intel LGA 11.5X and therefore LGA 1200 is fine. Uh, High-end Intel LGA 20XX sockets are also compatible. The heatsink and fan are all updated in black. The hardware is all black. Um, all of the mounting bars, the nuts are all finished in that same matte black. You do get two sets of fan clips. So if you wanted to mount a push-pull setup, that's uh, completely doable as well with out of the box. You just need to provide your own fan. Noctua's elongated screwdriver that accompanies many of their coolers is also included. The installation is straightforward and exactly what you would expect with Secure Firm 2. For AM4, mounting bars attached to the stock back plate over spacers, and then the cooler is placed atop the bars and the uh, mounting nuts are threaded on. For Intel, the included back plate is used, then spacers are placed over the standoffs over which mounting bars are installed by threading nuts over the standoffs. The heatsink attaches in a similar way to how it would for AM4. The tower is offset to one side. You can see it's not symmetrical and that's to allow for RAM clearance. For most mini ITX builds, it's a good idea to offset the tower cooler closer towards the end of the case since whether you're intaking or exhausting at the rear, the cooler will generally work better when that gap is smaller. So there's the added benefit of uh, no RAM interference. You just thread the heatsink on, then clip the fan on. As is customary with Noctua, they don't issue a TDP rating, but instead they give compatibility recommendations relative to the desired CPU. Noctua rates this cooler as suitable for medium overclocking on the 3600 uh, Ryzen 5 and 3700X Ryzen 7, and even suitable for low overclocking on the 3900 and 3950X. Now that chart hasn't been updated for uh, the Ryzen 5000, but in general, it's gonna be about the same. It'll be good for medium overclocking for Ryzen 5 and 7. 
Um, in Intel speak, CPUs up to the 10900K are actually rated as suitable for what they call medium overclocking, but I will caveat that Noctua's definition of overclocking seems to translate more to turbo clocks above the base clock rather than actually pushing the chip beyond its specification. There is a footnote on the compatibility chart that states that if power limits are disabled, then the CPU won't be able to keep the maximum turbo clocks uh, under prolonged AVX loads. Now, so to get to actual overclocking with Comet Lake, one does have to lift the power limits fairly significantly to get into that 5.0 gigahertz range. So this note suggests to me that basically they're recommending this for clocks up to the max turbo clocks with Common Lake, and that's exactly how I will test it. Before we get into thermal testing though, I wanted to emphasize that this is a niche 92 millimeter cooler that is designed to fit into cases with limited height. Therefore, for our comparisons against 120 millimeter fan equipped towers, it's not exactly reasonable. Now to kick things off, I ran this cooler with the Ryzen 5 5600X in the NR200 test system. For this case, if you're going for a tower cooler, I typically wouldn't recommend using anything less than 120 millimeter fan style of air cooling since, well, you can fit a taller cooler in the case, so why wouldn't you? And pricing is similar between this and the larger fan equipped Nocto U12S. But let's just take a look and see how the thermal gap is like. For the initial setup, since I wanted to place a fan at the back of the case later on, I just mounted the A9 fan in that pull position. With the 5600X locked at the same boost clock at 4.5 gigahertz on all cores and 1.25 volts, the thermals were just okay. Now for all three tests, which included a noise normalized, completely open top and open side test, a noise normalized closed vented panel test, and a 100% all out test, the U9S placed exactly as expected, which was behind any of the larger coolers for all the testing. The gap between the lowest place 120 millimeter single fan Arctic freezer unit was five degrees, although the gap closed a bit more when the case was closed. It was about 2.3 degrees behind that same cooler. Now, even though it's a 92 millimeter fan, it can seriously crank out some air at 100% or so, uh, which is 2000 RPM. At 100%, it's only a degree behind the Pure Rock 2, but it's much louder at 47 decibels. This being an unfair fight to begin with, I threw some optimizations at the cooler to see how much help it needed to be competitive. Now putting the 92 millimeter sickle flow at a fan at the back did not help, but I do anticipate this is helpful when the GPU is running. I did keep it at a lower RPM so as to not have a dramatic impact on noise, but if anything, it was still within measurement error for CPU only testing. Now since the roundup was done previously with just one top exhaust fan for consistency with the Mugen's larger width, I did place a Sickle Flow 120 at the top above this heatsink because it's totally compatible with that top fan, and that seemed to marginally improve things. Where things really saw the most meaningful improvement with was uh, when mounting a side panel fan exhausting. Now that just about evened the score against the Arctic Freezer 34, which can take a top fan over it, but the rad panel will not mount without some mods to the panel. So with some optimizations, this cooler is able to punch above its weight with performance in the range of what a bigger 120 millimeter cooler can provide, which is fairly impressive, which brings us to a use case for the shorter cooler in this bigger case. If you wanna use the rad panel without modding it, either for mounting a fan or more importantly to some, an HDD on the panel, this might be a good option to go with because if you use a cooler like this or a low profile cooler, you can fit the maximum number of two, three and a half inch HDDs in the NR200. Otherwise, it's not that thermals are terrible with it, but it's just a bit odd to spend more on a smaller boutique cooler in a case that can take a much larger tower cooler because you're just compromising on performance. For the main event though, and where I really wanted to check out this cooler was in my daily driver, which is an NK M1 running a 10700K and an NZXT AAO, uh, this unit here. 
which I added to the Noctua NFA 12 by 25s too. Unlike the NR200, cooling choices for this case are very simple because there's a big gap between compatible cooling methods, right? There's, um, and there's also a very big difference when the fans are in a suboptimal orientation. The fact that it only takes up to a 130 millimeter tall cooler, but takes this 240 millimeter EIO is a big reason for this asymmetry, as well as the lack of top exhaust in this case. The case is dependent on airflow from the bottom fans, and with an air-cooled GPU blocking them, fans are a lot less effective. By and large, liquid cooling will get you the best CPU performance in this case, and also provide some much-needed extra airflow. For the most part, a 240mm EIO is enough to tame the 10700K Beyond stock turbo boost of 4.7GHz all-core, and I have gotten this chip to 5.2GHz on all-cores with this exact setup. Now the problem with a 240mm EIO in this case is the space limitation, and just how tight everything is when you have one of these installed in there. And there's also the slightly audible noise, which is kind of ironic because by running these super quiet Noctuas, it actually makes the pump noise audible. So although the U9S is one of the best single tower coolers for the case, it's already going to be an uphill battle against my fairly optimized original cooling solution, but I was kind of curious how close it could get. This test was done with the CPU frequency locked at the highest all-core turbo clock of 4.7 gigahertz on a slight undervolt of 1.15 volts. Now normally I run this chip with a slight overclock of 4.8 gigahertz on all cores, but I also set it at minus 100 megahertz for AVX workload. So by default, the mother, uh, motherboard ran the Blender render at 4.7 gigahertz. Looking at the results, it's not great, but this falls in line with the gap I anticipated with this particular tower cooler. And I know it doesn't look that impressive, but then again, I'm actually pretty impressed that you could get this close with just one single 92 millimeter fan. It was completely stable at those boost clocks, and the best way to set up this cooler for the NKSM1 is with a side panel fan exhausting, and you can get a little help from a rear intake 92 millimeter fan. And this kind of runs the airflow from the back and out the side. It's completely serviceable, even with a higher powered chip like the 10700K. I used this specific setup for editing the last few videos on the channel and didn't notice too much of a performance difference uh, relative to the AO setup. I didn't have another A9 fan on hand to test and push-pull, and that is something I'd like to try to see how much of a benefit I can get from that. But at least for this build, I've got components fairly finalized, so eventually I will be migrating over to a hardline loop. So we'll see if we can get that uh, A9 fan tested before then. In summary, 92 millimeter towers are something that are very popular when there are cooler height constraints. And while the odds were stacked against this cooler in the testing, it actually proved itself quite capable. I just absolutely love how this cooler looks in the black NKSM1, and is, it is a fantastic option if this is the case you're looking to run it in. At the reference price of $65 US, the Chromax is just $5 more than the original version, which is a very fair premium considering the high quality finish on this cooler. But it is all about the, the appearance though. So if you don't want to look at it or you don't really care for the color, then you're fine just sticking to the original colorway. It hides fingerprints really well too, and it's just a really stealthy little machine. The fan is high quality, and when I cycled through the various RPMs, I did not detect any irregular noise patterns. If you're considering this little tower cooler, just know that while it's competent at stock boost clock, even with hotter chips like the 10700K, it's not the best option for overclocking outside of manufacturer specifications, unless you want to crank the fan up really loud. The cooler itself is not a new design, but it's always amazing to see the great work that Noctua is able to offer enthusiasts, both aesthetically and performance-wise. Though this cooler comes with a premium price tag, the fit and finish of this cooler is absolutely top-notch, starting from the base plate, the installation hardware, all the way to the heat fins and the fan. Now, this is a cooler that shows why Noctua represents the highest end of air cooling today. A big thanks for watching. I'm really looking forward to testing this against some other 92 millimeter towers in the future. And to get notified on that and other content, please make sure you subscribe to the channel. I will be leaving some product links down below, so feel free to use them if you found the review today helpful. Happy computing, and I'll see you all soon.